الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم المصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الهداة المهديين Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We have many enemies throughout our lives. Enemies that don't want us to succeed. Enemies that love when we fail, when we're hurt. Enemies that try their best to hinder our success in life. These enemies come in many shapes and forms. Sometimes the individuals closest to you can be your own enemies because of envy. Envy is a problem, is a factor that, create, that can create animosity between even the closest of people. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demonstrates that in the Holy Quran, two sons of prophets or the sons of two prophets you have prophet adam alayhi salam the first prophet of allah azza wa jal allah tells us the story of how one of his sons qabil cain killed his brother habil why because of envy because allah accepted the sacrifice of habil but not qabil he decided to kill his own brother because of that envy the other story is prophet yaqub Prophet Yaqub had many sons. Yusuf was the closest to him. His brothers, the brothers of Yusuf, developed envy towards him until they decided to kill him. They wanted to kill him, but in the end they decided to throw him in that well. And they got rid of him. They sold him as a slave. So envy can, be, can come between even brothers and sisters, family members, and create that animosity. So we may have many enemies throughout our lives, sometimes close people to us who don't want us to succeed, who cannot stand the fact that I am successful. That may create the animosity. Other times you'll find the animosity could be because of my religion, because I'm a Muslim, for example, because I'm a Shia, a follower of Ahlul Bayt, salam, and there are others who cannot stand that. So enemies can come in many shapes and forms. Al-Imam Al-Kadhim alayhi salam, the seventh Imam of Ahlul Bayt, who we have gathered here today in memory of the anniversary of his martyrdom when he died on the 25th day of Rajab, like today, in the dungeons of Harun, one of the Khulafa, one of the Caliphs of the Abbasid Empire. Al-Imam Al-Kadhim was asked about this specific question one day by his companion. Hisham ibn al-Hakam was one of the companions of Imam al-Kadhim. He was asked about this point. He told him, Oh son of Rasulullah, we have many enemies in our lives, but which enemy is the fiercest? Which enemy of those is the most dangerous and thus we have to be most cautious and vigilant of? The Imam quickly replies to him. He tells him, Yes, indeed, we do have many enemies in our lives. But there is one specific enemy that stands out, that's outstanding, that's unique. This enemy is the most dangerous. This enemy is the most fiercest, has the most animosity towards you. But at the same time, this enemy is the most difficult for you to even see. You don't even notice this enemy. He says, this enemy does not fight you just by himself. When he wants to fight you, he tries to look for allies so that they can form an alliance against you and then launch one massive offensive against you. So Hisham ibn al-Hakam, under that suspense, he asks him, who is it, O son of Rasulullah? The Imam tells him, this enemy that you have to be vigilant of is none other than Iblis, is none other than the shaitan, the devil who has been entrusted with misguiding human beings. When Allah Azza wa Jal tells us the story of Iblis in the Quran, He shows us this, that Allah told him to prostrate to Adam alongside all the other angels. But because of his ego, because of his arrogance, he declined 
He said, how can I prostrate to someone that is inferior to me? I am made of fire. He is made of clay. I will never prostrate to him. His arrogance and he was talking back against Allah Azza wa Jal. Because of his arrogance and the fact that he refused to follow the orders of Allah, Allah banished him from paradise. And he condemned him for eternity. Now, Iblis, the shaitan, he saw that he lost everything. He lost his lofty position with the angels. And he has been condemned and he has been turned into the devil. So now he's filled with envy once again. Towards whom? Towards Adam. Instead of being sincere and genuine and being honest that it's my fault. It's because of my arrogance that I fell. He directed all of his vengeance because of his failure towards Adam. It was his fault. Before he came along, I was fine. I was with the angels. God loved me and everything was going very well for us. Until he showed up and because of him, I lost everything that I had. So he set out to take out all that vengeance on Adam. And he did it in front of Allah, the Quran says. He told Allah, fine, I have lost everything. I just have one request. Give me time until the day of judgment. Give me free time and freedom to do whatever I want and then hold me accountable on the day of judgment. But as long as judgment day hasn't come, give me the, the, the freedom to do what I want. And Allah told him, fine. Then he told Allah, he made a vow. He told him, قَالَ فَبِعَزَّتِكَ لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ he swore by the might of Allah Azza wa Jal. And this shows you the audacity, how rude the shaitan is. Look at what he does. He swore by the might and glory of Allah that I will try my best to misguide every single son and daughter of Adam. He knew that Adam is going to have a progeny, human beings like you and I. I will go after not just Adam. He did go after Adam. And he even misguided him. He made him eat from the tree. But that wasn't enough to quench the animosity and the envy of shaitan. He said, you know what? It's not enough that I go after Adam and Eve. I'm going to go after every single human being, children of Adam. Why? Because of their father. Because it was their father's fault based on his logic. And I will try my best to misguide every single one of them. He is swearing by the might and glory of God and he's telling this to God himself that I will try my best. He swore, he made a vow to misguide every single human being. He told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, you know what? Fine, go after the human beings and whoever follows you and becomes a follower of the shaitan, then his fate will be like the fate of shaitan. So this shows you the animosity of shaitan. That not only did he go after Adam, but he vowed to Allah that he will go after every single one of us, you and I, until the day of judgment. This shows you what type of an evil enemy we have. What type of an enemy that we're dealing with. An enemy that vowed that has nothing to do but to guide, misguide human beings. That's his 24 hour job. And what makes the shaitan more dangerous is four things, brothers and sisters. The shaitan, the devil, has four powers given to him. Four strong points that he uses against us. Number one, the first strong point of the shaitan, of the devil, is his quantity. You see, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala banished him, he made a request to Allah. He told him, Ya Allah, I want you to give me children just like you give Adam children. That's not fair. If it's going to be a test, it's going to be a competition. He has children. I also want children. So Allah said, fine, you can also have children. So that's why the Imam, the Imam al-Sadiq says in the hadith that for every human being born, there is a devil born for the shaitan. And that devil will be allocated and designated just for that newborn. So every time a human being is born, you know there are websites that show you 
per second how the human population is growing. You've seen it. It's like every second it goes up by 10 or 15 or 20. So at the same time that the human population is growing, the devil population is also growing. That devil that is newly born is allocated just for this new human being. He has nothing to do 24 hours. He's entrusted to misguide this human being. So the greatest army on earth, my friends, is not the Russian army that you see now on TV. There's an army that is much, much bigger and much more fierce. And that is the army of the shaitan. So if we have almost 8 billion human beings, there must be almost 8 billion devils. We think the devil is just one guy by himself. Of course not. He has a massive army of minions under him trying to misguide humanity. So this is number one. His strong point is his quantity. Number two, the second strong point of the shaitan, of the devil, is his proximity. What do I mean? The shaitan has been given 24 hours of uninterrupted access to the human being. Anytime he wants, him and his stooges and minions, they can come and they can just monitor us. They can just watch us. They can be there with us 24 hours a day. No matter where we are, what we're doing, even in our bedrooms, he can come and just analyze us. And you know what the shaitan does with this access? So what? Let him come and join me. I don't care. No, he uses that to gather intelligence. See, intelligence anytime there's a war is very important. You need to know everything about your enemy, right? That's why the strongest countries that have the most powerful militaries today are the ones that have the strongest intelligence. Correct? The CIA, the FBI, the MI6 and all of that. The job of the intelligence is to gather information about the enemy. What's their strong points? What's their weak points? How do we attack? Correct? The shaitan does not have a one tool for all. One size fits all. Tool to misguide human beings. No, because human beings are different. He will look for your weak spot. Now how does he know your weak spot? He has to come and analyze you, study you. Maybe for a month, for two months, until he can come up with a technique. He's very sophisticated, my friends. He doesn't use primitive methods. As we advance, as we progress, he also progresses. He knows some people, their weak spot is what? Is money. This person will do anything for money. So he attacks me through that weak spot. Other people, their weak spot may be fame. They will do anything for a like. They will do anything for people to follow them on social media. This is the route that he chooses with that individual. For others, it may be through women and girls. This is the path that he will pursue. So for everyone, he studies me and then he attacks. This is number two. Number three, the third weapon of the shaitan or the third power of the shaitan, strong point, is his nature. The shaitan, my friends, is invisible. Can we see the shaitan? If you can see the shaitan, I highly urge you to see a psychologist. We shouldn't be able to see the shaitan, right? Allah says that in the Holy Quran. He's invisible. He says, Allah says that he and his people, his minions, the other shayateen, they can see you, but you can't see them. That in itself makes the war between the human race and the shaitans more difficult. Because he can see you, he has an advantage over you, but you can't see him. So never think that you're by yourself. Sometimes I'm all by myself in my car singing. The shaitan could be sitting right next to me. Who knows, correct? He's plotting, he's trying to plan against me. I cannot see him. So this is number three, the third strong point of the shaitan. And finally, number four. The fourth strong point of the shaitan is his weapon. The weapon that he uses is not any conventional weapon that we're used, we're used to. He doesn't use any tanks. You know, you see today on TV what Russia's doing. He doesn't use any tanks. He doesn't use any F-16s. He doesn't use any guns, any knives. He uses something that is more dangerous than that. The weapon of the shaitan, my friends, is dangerous because it is unnoticed. It is undetectable. He strikes and you don't even know it. You know, they say there are certain poisons where, and nerve agents where uh, 
when you are exposed to them, you know, it doesn't do anything to you. After a week, after 10 days, I don't know, we see that in the James Bond movies. I, I hope it's real. It does exist. So right then and there, it doesn't affect you right away. The effect, the harm will only show after a couple of days. Why? Because if, it's, if the effect is spontaneous, then the perpetrator will be easily found. But if it's after a while, then they don't know what happened. Where, did he, where was he exposed? This is exactly how the shaitan is. And by the way, you know, this was something that made the, you know, the coronavirus dangerous. The fact that it's in stealth mode. You are many times carrying this virus and you don't even know it. It's there inside you. And sometimes it could even, even be damaging your lungs and you don't even know it. I remember once I read a story of someone who got into a car accident and he was taken to the to the hospital because of the accident. They did a CT scan and they found out half of his lungs completely destroyed because he already had COVID and he had no idea. He had absolutely no idea. So it destroys you, kind of like, you know, cancer also. It destroys you from the inside and you have no idea. And sometimes you only realize once it's too late. The fourth power of the shaitan is that his weapon is in stealth mode. He attacks you, he plans and plots, and you have no idea. Now what is the weapon of the shaitan? He only has one weapon. His weapon doesn't sound to be too scary. Doesn't sound to be too destructive. The weapon of the shaitan is one thing and only one thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about in the Holy Quran. His weapon is whispering. All he can do is whisper. He comes and he suggests he plants ideas in your head. Do this, do that, don't do this. He encourages and discourages. But he does it in such a subtle way that you don't even know it's the shaitan telling you this. You think it's your own idea, but it's in fact it's the shaitan. He comes, he sees that you have a train of thought, right? He very, very evilly inserts one of his ideas in the middle of your ideas. You think it's your idea, but it's not. It's the shaitan. It's one of the insinuations of the shaitan. And you had no idea. You go out and carry, you execute that idea thinking it's your idea. While in fact, you're being an agent. You're being used by the shaitan to carry out his own ideas. This is the weapon of the shaitan. It's so subtle. He's in stealth mode. And the holy prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke about this in one hadith. He said, Yajri. Iblis Adam majra dami min al -uruq. He said that Iblis, the shaitan, he flows within. This is the, these, these are the exact words the Prophet uses. He says he flows within you. He flows within you in the same way your blood flows in your veins. Now what does the Prophet mean by that? Right now you're listening to this lecture. Is your blood flowing in your veins or not? It is, of course, or else you couldn't live. Do you feel it? Who can feel his blood flowing in his veins? No one. It happens naturally without you feeling it. Correct? You are so focused on the lecture, you're focused on having your meal, but your blood is doing its job. It's flowing. Your heart is pumping blood. You can't feel any of that. The Prophet says the shaitan plans and plots and attacks while you have no idea. You're sleeping. You're living your life, enjoying it, while he is planning and plotting. Exactly like blood flowing in your blood. This is what makes the shaitan so dangerous, my friends. And that's why Imam al-Kadhim, he tells his companion, Hisham al-Hakam, be careful of the shaitan. You do not even see him or consider him as an enemy, but he is an enemy. Now, having said all of that, do not be too despondent. Do not lose hope. Because at the end of the day, the only thing that the shaitan can do is whisper. He cannot force anyone to commit haram. He cannot force anyone to go the wrong way. He can just suggest. He can just tell you. So obviously you can tell him no. At the end of the day, it's your call. It's your decision. Because he has not been given authority over any human being. And Allah says that in the Holy Quran. After he vowed to Allah that I will try my best to misguide every single human being, Allah told him, إِنَّ عِبَادِي لَيْسَ لَكَ عَلَيْهِمْ سُلْطَانِ 
He told them, my servants, my slaves, the human beings, you will not be given authority over them to force someone to, for example, scare someone into committing a haram. No. He can just suggest. He can just plant. He can just tell you, encourage you. You can tell him no. You can tell him no. So he cannot force anyone. If someone ends up following the shaitan, it's because of that person's own bad decision. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran that on the day of judgment, we human beings, after Allah shows us our sins and crimes, we have a tendency to look for scapegoats, right? We, we like to deflect the blame anytime. That I'm accused of something, oh, it was his fault, it was her fault, he told me, she told me. So Allah tells us on the, say of, on the day of judgment, we'll do that. When Allah shows me my sins and crimes, we will point all of us at the shaitan. Ya Allah, it was him. He told me to do it. It's his fault. Now the shaitan is more clever than you and I. He even knows how to defend himself. Allah tells us how the shaitan will defend himself on the day of judgment when billions of people are all just blaming him. It was because of him that I committed this sin. So Allah will allow him to defend himself. Allah is just. He will hold trial for everyone, even the shaitan. Okay, you can defend yourself. The shaitan will say this. وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ The Quran says. وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرُ After everything was done and people are sentenced, the shaitan now will speak. He is blamed. وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرُ وَمَا كَانَ لِي عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانُ إِلَّا أَنْ دَعَوْتُكُمْ فَاسْتَجَبْتُمْ لِي the, so the, the shaitan will say, look, Allah himself said that I didn't force anyone. I was not given authority over anyone. When you committed all those sins, it was your fault. All I did was I invited you. I told you to commit this sin. Why did you listen to me? Didn't Allah Azza wa Jal tell you not to listen to the shaitan? How many verses in the Quran Allah tells us the shaitan is your enemy? Do not listen to him. Treat him as an enemy. Why did you listen to me? I just invited you and you accepted. You said fine. You said okay. You joined based on your own free will. You willingly joined. So do not blame me. فَلَا تَلُومُونِي وَلُومُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ So don't blame me. Blame yourself. You had a very weak willpower. You see how he gets away? He makes you. He gets you into committing the sin. And then he leaves you all alone for yourself. So at the end of the day, it's my choice. When I have an evil thought in my mind, do this, don't do that, you know, don't pray today, inshallah tomorrow, next week, or let me watch this, do that, go there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me the choice to say no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has equipped me with intellect, and my intellect will tell me, before you do any act, think about it. That's why many ahadith tell us, before you say anything, before you do anything, think. Don't just do it. Some people, they just, anything that comes in their mind, they just blurt it out. Any idea that comes, they do it. No. There's a famous saying of one of the ulama where he says, before I want to do anything, or before I want to say any word, I think about that seven times, not just once, for an entire minute. Is this a good idea? Could this be one of the insinuations of the shaitan? What are the ramifications? What are the consequences? Is this a good idea or not? Think about it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in that way, He will allow me to be successful. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Now, as I said in the beginning, as the hadith of the Imam said, the shaitan is very clever. When he wants to fight you, he tries to look for Allies, why should I fight against this person alone? I know this person has other enemies, so let me conspire with his other enemies. It makes the war much more easy. So that's why one of the tactics of the shaitan is that he looks for allies against me. Now, as we said, the shaitan is one of our greatest enemies. There's also another enemy that we have in our lives that's also trying to take us down. That's also trying to hinder my progress. That second enemy, my friends, sometimes can even be more dangerous than the shaitan. Because this enemy of ours lies and sleeps within ourselves. 
And that enemy is our own nafs. And that's why the famous hadith of the Prophet says, He says, your greatest enemy, don't look too far and wide. Your greatest enemy is within you, is your nafs that is inside you. And the reason why our nafs is so dangerous, my friends, is because it's so close to us. It's within us. It knows everything about me. And that proximity in itself poses that danger. Imagine you had an enemy that was far away in Ukraine, for example, today. And that enemy is thousands of miles away. Now, because he's so far away, you don't feel too much threatened. There isn't too much imminent danger. But imagine that enemy of yours rides a plane and he lands in Detroit airport. You're going to start panicking a little. Why? Because he's closer to you now. Imagine he takes a cab from Detroit airport and he comes to Dearborn Heights. You are told that we saw your enemy in Dearborn Heights looking for you. You're going to panic even more. Imagine as I speak... The door opens and you see that enemy that has vowed to destroy you, or one of your greatest enemies, enters this hall. You're going to start sweating. Imagine out of all the seats, not too many seats empty, but there is an empty seat next to you. He comes and he sits next to that. He sits on that seat next to you. You're not going to be able to breathe because the closer he is, the more danger you feel. Imagine if that enemy sits inside you. My own nafs, my own desires and fetishes and temptations is my enemy. So the shaitan is clever. He knows that your nafs is also one of your enemies. What does he do? He conspires with your own nafs. He knows your nafs has inclinations and temptations. He goes and he tries to work on your nafs to provoke it, to encourage it. That's why the Holy Quran says, وَإِنَّ النَّفْسَ لَأَمَّارَةٌ بِالسُّوءُ إِلَّا مَا رَحِمَ رَبِّي Your nafs gives you orders to commit haram, gives you orders to do certain acts that displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, gives you commandments, gives you orders. The shaitan knows this, so he goes and he becomes an ally to my nafs so that they can work together against me. Until finally, you know what happens? Until finally the shaitan successfully manages to make me a slave to my own nafs. You know how many people, my friends, you don't notice that, are slaves to their own nafs? They worship their nafs. And I mean this literally. Allah mentions this in the Holy Quran. He says, Have you not seen those individuals that worship not Allah, but they worship their own self, their own desires, their hawa? Their temptations. Yes, maybe through lip service, verbally they will declare that I worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe they'll even stand to pray before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But their true devotion is not to Allah, but to their nafs, to their desires. This is what the shaitan does to me. When he conspires with the nafs, he makes me a servant of my own, a slave of my own desires, that I am more worried about my desires then I am worried about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. During the time of Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam, there was a, a man that was famous for his wickedness, a man that was famous for his immorality. He was called Bishr al-Hafi. He was a follower of Ahlul Bayt, but through his actions, he was a follower of his own desires. He was a follower of the shaitan. Every night he would have parties in his house, alcohol, Man and woman dancing and every haram you can think about. Imam al-Kadhim alayhi salam is walking in, in the city one day and he comes across the house of Bishr al-Hafi. As he comes across this house, he notices a woman comes out of the back door and she's taking out some trash or something like that. So the imam hears all that loud music. You can tell this is a place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being disobeyed. So he stands disappointed. And he asks this lady, to whom does this house belong to? She tells him it belongs to my master. 
So this answer in itself tells you two things. Number one, that she's a slave. There were slaves back then. And number two, her master is obviously a free human being. He's not a slave because she called him my master. So who's your master? He asks. She says, it is Bishr. And the imam has heard of this man. So the imam understood her answer, but he wanted to deliver a message. He told her, is your master a slave or a free man? She told him, of course he's a free man. I said my master. He's a free man. He's not a slave. How can my master be also a slave? She didn't get the point. The imam then told her this. He told her, you know what? You're, what you said is true. He is not a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because if he was a slave of Allah, he would have been ashamed to commit all this haram in front of Allah while he's watching him. He just said this word, he planted these words, and he left. This lady was shocked. What was this? Who was this man? What did he mean by this? So she quickly went inside the house. She called her master, Bishr, and she told him of the story. This man came and he, said, he asked me, to whom does this house belong to? I told him, my master. He said, is he a slave or a free man? I told him a free man. He said, you're right. If he was a slave to Allah, then he would have been ashamed to commit all this haram. Bishr, as soon as he heard this reply, automatically he knew this is an Imam al kabir Because he knew such words of wisdom cannot come but from the Imam. So he felt so disappointed you know, that the Imam said this about me. So he quickly came out looking for the Imam. The Imam was far. He came running after him. He told him, oh, son of Rasulullah, ibn Rasulullah, why did you tell that to my slave that I am not a slave of Allah? Of course I'm a slave of Allah. Of course I worship Allah. He told him, if you truly worshipped God, then you would have been ashamed. You would have been embarrassed. You commit all this haram in front of him as if he's not watching. What type of a lousy slave are you? You do this in front of, if, imagine your own slave disrespected you and disobeyed you every day. Would you stay silent or would you get rid of the slave? The imam told them, you're not a slave of God. You don't worship Allah. You're a slave of your own desires. Your desires control you. You worship your own desires. He said this and left. These subhanAllah very short words that the imam told Bishr al-Hafi completely changed him. He went back thinking, you know what? For my entire life, I claim to worship Allah, but did I ever show that? Is it just through words that we claim that I am a servant of Allah Azza wa Jal and I don't show that through my practice, through my actions? If I am truly a slave to Allah and He is my master, then should I not show my submission, my devotion to Him, my respect to Him, my obedience to Him? And he decided to transform his life. He kicked out everybody in the house and he transformed into a abid, into a prostrator. And he made up for all those lost years that he was away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he turned into an angel. He turned into a prostrator that would always be found in the masjid worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Such that he became an example of a noble holy person that devotes his life to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How did that transformation happen my friends? Just by realizing this point. Who do I worship? Do I worship Allah or do I worship my own desires? Let me give you an example today. One aspect that many of us struggle with is salah. When it's the time for salah, Allah is calling me. He is my Lord. I worship Him. So I should run to my Lord. No matter what I'm doing, I should leave it because I worship Him. And everything else is secondary, right? Theoretically, that's how it should be. But why is it with salah, we delay and delay and delay and we find so many excuses, right? And sometimes they may be valid excuses, but at the end of the day, do my actions really show that I worship Allah? Now this is on one hand. And then look at what we do when there's a Sunday 6 o'clock game. Does anyone come late to the game? 6.45, remember there's a football game, there's a Super Bowl. Wallahi, 6 o'clock starts, 5.45, we're all there waiting to watch the game. This is ibadah, this is worship. This is devotion. That when you're so devoted and in love with something that you will not miss a minute of it. Salah, one day I pray, one day I don't pray, one day I pray in the beginning, one day in the end. Who cares? This is worship. I don't see this as worship. 
Worship is devotion. When you love something, when you admire someone, that you're like a soldier there even before Adhan time. How many people do we have like that? And then just compare that to what we do with sports games and how on time we are and punctual and everyone has to be quiet and put your phones on silent. This is our true devotion. So let's think and reflect once again, my friends. As the Imam told Bishr al-Hafi, who do we worship? Do we worship Allah Azza wa Jal? Or do we worship our own desires? When there's a movie, it starts at 8. You know how there's like 20 commercials before that? Nobody goes when the movie starts. We all want to watch even the commercials. That's how, you know, the, some people, they do the mustahabbat, the extra recommended acts. You see them in the masjid there before time. They're doing the Quran. They're doing the tasbih. They're doing all these extra things, right? This is how we are when we go to the theaters. We go there beforehand. We need time to buy popcorn. We need time to buy... You see people come, Salat Jama'ah, they haven't done their wudu, they're late, they miss the first Salat. Because Salat and Allah is always secondary to us. So through my tongue, I stand before Allah and I tell Him, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, there is no God but Allah, and I am His proud slave. But our actions prove that our love and devotion, admiration is somewhere else. Even during Salat, when I am praying, my mind is focused on somewhere else. I'm praying to Allah, but I'm thinking about work, I'm thinking about my family, I'm thinking about the game and how did, you know, how was that, uh, you know, if it's soccer, goal not offside and whatever, you know. I'm thinking about hundreds of things in my salah and then I consider myself as a good servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this year, my friends, as we live through the anniversary of the martyrdom of Imam al kazim let's ponder upon those words, those powerful words that he told Bishr al hafi And his words are so powerful that they can potentially be life-changing, as it did to Bishr al hafi Just this word that the Imam told him, think about it. Do you worship Allah or you worship your desires? It can't be both of them. He thought about it and he realized the Imam is right. Throughout my life, my desires and what I want to do and what makes me feel good, what makes me happy and what comforts me and my fun and entertainment is what I worship. If I miss the game one week, the entire week will be miserable for me. But if I miss 10 salats, I can live on perfectly. This shows us who we really worship. And this shows us who we really love. So let us take this opportunity, brothers and sisters, to come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and align our actions with our words. That when we say, we worship you, Ya Allah, we love you, we are your servants and your slaves, let's also show that through our actions. And one of the best ways is through salah. Let's take our salah more seriously because salah, our prayer, is when we sit to communicate with Allah, to show Him that we love Him, that we care for Him, to thank Allah Azza wa for all the good things that He's given us in our lives. We do that through our salah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us all, to forgive us, to accept our a'mal. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the reappearance of the 12th Imam, Ajal Allah ta'ala, Farajahu Sharif. Before I end, I want to remind all of you, brothers and sisters, of the fundraising dinner that the IIA, inshallah, will host on March 13th. I advise all of you to attend, inshallah, to buy the tickets and attend and support the Islamic Institute of America. As I said, we're only about just over two weeks, or exactly, I think, two weeks away, March 13th. So inshallah, you and your families can all attend. And before I end, I also want to uh, ask all of you to recite Surah Al-Fatiha for the late Hajjawan Dafayiz Turfa, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alayha. So let us keep her in our du'as through these days. And let us recite Surah Al-Fatiha for her and all of the believers that have passed away after a loud salawat for Muhammad and Al Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad, ali Muhammad. Bismillah.